Today's webinar, we're going to discuss precision radius metrology. The webinar will review various methods for radius metrology, starting with a simple spherometer and then moving on to high precision metrology using interferometers and laser distance measuring metrology. We'll end with a discussion of some test results we achieved on a high precision 300 millimeter workstation. When we look at the precision required for radius metrology, the uncertainty is driven by the application. We start with coarse measurements, typically made on ground surfaces during a generating process. At this level, an uncertainty of 1% is adequate. We then move on to standard catalog optics and lower precision commercial optics. These elements typically require uncertainties of about 0.1%. As we get to precision optics, such as those used for high-end photography and military applications, the required uncertainty migrates to 0.01% or 100 parts per million. And finally, for ultra-precision optics, such as those used in lithography, it's necessary to characterize the radius to better than 10 parts per million. The typical method for measuring the radius of curvature of ground surfaces is with a spherometer. The spherometer is a very simple device which measures the sag of the spherical surface over a known baseline. The user starts by setting the three feet on a known flat surface and adjusting the measuring point for the zero indicator reading. Next, the spherometer is placed on the surface to be measured and the center probe is adjusted to measure the sag of the surface. It's a simple matter then to compute the radius of the surface. The equation I give in this slide is a simplification. Typically spherometers do not have infinitely sharp contact points, rather they use spherical balls and a correction needs to be made for these radius of these spheres. Most modern spherometers are more sophisticated than the simple one shown here Mechanical spherometers often have dial depth gauges for more accurate measurements. If you can measure the depth to 5 to 10 microns, the resulting radius uncertainty for a 50 millimeter f2.5 part is about half a percent to 1 percent. There are also companies which make integrated spherometers with electronic readouts that claim accuracies of 0 0.05 percent to 0 0.005 percent for certain ranges of part radii and diameters. The next step down in uncertainty is a test plate. A test plate is a gauge which is made to the desired radius and characterized using some other method to a very low uncertainty. The part under test is then placed on the test plate or sometimes the test plate is placed on the part and illuminated with narrow band visible light source. The fringe pattern shows the change in spacing between the two surfaces. If the fringes are straight, then the part under test and the test plate have the same radii. If they're curved, then the amount of curvature measured in fractions of a fringe indicate a radius mismatch. If we assume it's possible to see a half a fringe of curvature reliably, this corresponds to about 0.015% on this same f2.5 surface with a 50 millimeter radius of curvature. There are two major disadvantages of test plates. The first is that the two surfaces are essentially in contact during use, and any grit or contamination in the space between the surfaces can result in digs and scratches on the part under test. The other disadvantage is that the test plate has to be made specifically for a particular radii. So for each part you need to test, you need a separate test plate. On the positive side, once you've designed and built test plates, the test during fabrication is extremely fast and easy to interpret. Some of the disadvantages of test plates can be eliminated 
using an interferometer to create a virtual test plate. To do this, a transmission sphere is installed on the interferometer, and then a master pre-qualified surface is placed on a kinematic mount on the part stage. The interference pattern is nulled by adjusting the part stage to eliminate all the power in the fringe pattern, and then you lock the stage in position. After removing the master part, the optician can insert the production parts one at a time, and just like a test plate, the optician can estimate the fringe straightness. This method is not any more accurate than a test plate, but it is faster, and there's no contact with the test part within the clear aperture. Also, the part stage is infinitely adjustable, so you can measure any radius part within the range of adjustment of your um, test stage slide. Now we move on to using an interferometer and a radius slide to measure the radius of curvature of a spherical surface. Zygo manufactures a range of radius slides to help with this measurement. The concept of radius measurement with an interferometer and a radius slide is quite simple. The part under test is set up the same way it would be for testing surface figure in a confocal cavity. Once the part is set up and aligned for a null fringe pattern, the part is translated to the cat's eye position. And once again, the fringe pattern is nulled. If we then measure the distance that the stage moved, that is the radius of curvature of the part. The radius slide simplifies this procedure by providing a guide rail for the translation and an encoder for measuring the amount of translation. The best accuracy is obtained when the F number of the transmission sphere is well matched to the R number of the part under test, allowing the entire aperture to be measured. A well-matched cavity maximizes the focus sensitivity and reduces measurement uncertainty. The concept of an interferometric radio slide is simple. The devil is in the details. There are three major contributors to uncertainty and numerous small contributors. We will, today we will look at each of the major uncertainties individually and discuss how they can be minimized. The first error is Abbe sign error. Abbe was a famous German optical scientist who, along with Carl Zeiss, was a co-owner co of Carl Zeiss AG. Abbe stated that the axis of line of measurement should coincide with the axis of the measuring instrument or line of the measuring scale. Let's look at the radius scale shown previously and see how the Abbe sign error can affect measurement uncertainty. The first thing to notice is that the linear encoder is offset laterally from the optical axis of the interferometer. Our desired measurement is the translation of the part under test, but what we're actually measuring is the distance that the carriage moves along the rail. At first glance, these should be the same, and they would be if the rail were perfect. Unfortunately, real rails and tables are not perfect. For example, no rail is perfectly straight. So as the carriage moves along the rail, it will tilt slightly as it tracks the rail. As the stage tilts, there'll be slight variation in the distance traveled by the part under test relative to the distance measured by the encoder on the rail. In addition, there can be some backlash as the direction of motion changes. Typical rails, when properly fabricated and installed, can have a straightness of about 5 microns over the contact area of the sta stage carriage. As a simple approximation, if we assume that the baseline of the contact points against the rail is equal to the offset between the rail and the optical axis, then the straightness of the rail is equal to the Abbe error. In other words, a 5 micron Straightness error in the rail results in 5 microns of measurement uncertainty. We should also note that the flatness of the table can have a similar effect if the encoder is mounted down at the table level. The radius scales produced by Zygo eliminate this error 
by raising the height of the encoder to the height of the optical axis. So how can this error be eliminated? One way to do that is to measure the translation at the optical axis and not at some offset location. That's obviously not easy to do with a mechanical scale such as this, but we'll look at ways to solve that problem later in the presentation. The next error is endpoint uncertainty. What is endpoint uncertainty? Well, if you remember from earlier in the presentation, I stated that if a part was nulled at the confocal position and then translated to cat's eye, or once again the fringe pattern was nulled, then the distance the stage moved is equal to the radius of curvature. The question is, how well can the operator null the cavity? At the confocal position, for a reasonable quality optic, it can probably be nulled to a quarter to a half a fringe. And if you have an extremely good quality part, say better than a tenth wave, where the fringes can be very straight, you might be able to get it um, even a little bit better. But even if the part's very good, when you go to the cat side position, you'll notice that the fringe pattern is not particularly good due to the errors in the interferometer and the transmission sphere. So can you look at this bottom fringe pattern and tell when you're nulled to a quarter wave or a half a wave? Probably not, not easily at least. If you can only get it to a half a wave, then on our 50 millimeter radius F2.5 part, that will be equivalent to about 160 parts per million of error. Fortunately, if you have a phase measuring interferometer, it can help you to do this a little bit more accurately. You can look at the power readout for a measurement at each position and then adjust the focus slightly until you minimize the power reported. If you have patience and you iterate, you can probably get down to about 30 parts per million using this technique. The computer itself, though, can do even better. If the computer knows the F number of the part under test and the R number, uh, I'm sorry, if the computer knows the R number of the part under test and the F number of the transmission sphere, then it can measure the power in each of the two cavities and use that to actually compute the focus error in distance along the scale this computation is accurate to about one parts per million. So it can reduce the uncertainty considerably. Zygos phase measuring interferometers, when used with Zygos radius slides, perform this computation automatically. The final error we have to discuss is encoder error. Encoder errors can be broken down into cosine errors and scale errors. The cosine error is the error caused by the misalignment between the encoder axis and the direction of travel of the stage. In other words, if we were to put the encoder tape onto the guide rail at a slight angle, the measured distance would be greater than the, stage, than the distance traveled by the stage by a factor of one over the cosine of the angle error. It turns out, though, that this is quite small. One part per million is equivalent to 1.4 milliradians of misalignment or 1.4 millimeters over a one meter travel distance. Alignment to better than this level of precision is not difficult, so this error is not usually significant. Scale errors, on the other hand, can be significant. There are many types of materials used for linear encoders. Plastic, steel tape, and glass ceramic are the most common. Steel and plastic tape suffer from uncertainty to the, due to the quality of the material and the ability to apply it properly to the um, slide itself. This uncertainty is in the range of 5 to 15 microns. In addition, steel encoder tape has a thermal expansion coefficient of about 10 parts per million per degree, and plastic tape stretches with a substrate. So when applied on an aluminum rail, it has an expansion coefficient of about 22 parts per million per degree. Glass ceramic scales can reduce this error significantly, but they're much more expensive and difficult to use. The best solution 
is a distance measuring interferometer, which we'll discuss later in the presentation. On Zygo's radius slide, we use an aluminum guide rail with a plastic tape encoder. The encoder is calibrated prior to shipment to eliminate periodic errors that are typically present in the encoder tape. The total uncertainty of this type of rail, once calibrated, is between 25 and 50 microns over a translation distance of one and a half meters. For a 50 millimeter radius, this is 50 to 1,000 parts per million in uncertainty. And for longer radii, it's of, say, 500 millimeter, the radius scale uncertainty is about 50 to 100 parts per million. So what can be done to minimize the errors of the radius scale that uses the tape encoder? We discussed earlier how phase measuring interferometer can be used to significantly reduce endpoint errors. But what about the ABI errors and encoder errors? Both ABI and encoder errors can be minimized by switching from a tape encoder to a displacement measuring interferometer with a measurement beam aligned parallel and coincident with the optical axis of the interferometer. The image shown on this slide is a, an interferometric radius slide where there is a retroreflector placed on the rear of the five-axis adjustable mount. And the laser beam is right on the optical axis, and that helps to eliminate the AVI error, and it also guarantees that um, if you line it up correctly, that you're eliminating any alignment errors. But remember, now that we're using an interferometer to measure the distance of travel, the scale factor is the index or is the wavelength of light. Wavelength of light, unfortunately, is not constant. The frequency is, but the wavelength is not. And the wavelength varies with the index of error. The index of error can be calculated using the Edlin equation with the inputs of temperature, pressure, and humidity. The table on this slide shows the sensitivity of the index of error versus uh, a small changes in temperature, pressure, and humidity. On the radius scales that Zygo provides, the equation is included in the software so that by entering the uh, weather information, the errors can be reduced to insignificant levels. It should be noted that for precision measurements, entering accurate values for temperature and pressure are the most critical. It's also important to avoid allowing any vaporized solvents, such as those used to clean optics, into the DMI measurement beam, as they can have an even larger effect on the local index of air than the weather. One disadvantage of this particular setup is that the displacement measuring interferometer has the longest air path when measuring the shortest radius parts. This adds more noise into the measurement of short radius parts due to air turbulence. This isn't necessarily the best solution, but it works considerably better than having a magnetic type encoder scale on the guide rail. It should be noted that the index that the variation in the index of error in the measurement cavity is not critical to the measurement of radius. It's only the index variation in the DMI laser beam that is important. We'll now show a short video of an interferometric radius slide used to measure the radius of a test plate. In this video, we have a Zygo verifier interferometer equipped with a radius slide using a distance measuring interferometer. Okay, I'm going to start the video now. Hopefully it'll play smoothly for most of you. And I'll give a little commentary on how the measurement is done. Whoops, I'm sorry. Okay, the first step is to select and install the transmission sphere. As mentioned earlier, the transmission sphere should be selected to closely match the R number of the part under test. Once the transmission sphere is installed in the interferometer, we use the alignment mode to center the return spot from the reference surface. Next, the part under test is moved to the cat's eye position, and the interferometer is switched to view mode. 
In the view mode, a fringe pattern is observed. The fringe pattern is nulled by adjusting the Z position of the test part and the tip tilt of the transmission sphere mount. This process critically aligns the optical axis of the transmission sphere to the optical axis of the interferometer. Once the cat's eye position is nulled, we switch back to the align mode and move the part under test to the approximate confocal position. Once again, the fringe pattern is nulled by adjusting the X, Y position of the part under test as well as the Z position. When the cavity is well nulled, the user can enter the parameters for the measurement and press the measure button. The interferometer will then take the data at the confocal position. Okay, when, when the confocal measurement is complete, there's the measurement right now, when the confocal measurement is complete, then the operator moves the uh, mount to the cat's eye position and you can use the uh, distance readout on the screen to help you get to that position if you happen to know what the radius is. Again, the fringe pattern is nulled, this time using only the z-axis adjustment. You press OK and the final measurement will appear. I'd like to pause this right now if I can. If you notice in the lower right, there's a table and I'm not sure that it's easy to read on your screen, but in this case, the operator did a reasonably good job of nulling the fringe pattern in both the confocal and cat's eye positions. But just as an example, the worst case nulling was 0.144 waves, a little more than an eighth of a wave, and that, that resulted in a confocal focus error of almost a micron. I think it's 0.9 microns. So you can see that if you're trying to measure to uncertainties of better than a micron, you really need to use the interferometer to compute the endpoint error corrections. So the interferometric radius light can achieve uncertainties in the 10 parts per million range if it's used with care. There are still some variables which cannot be completely eliminated. The ultimate commercially available system built by Zygome which has proven to have the lowest uncertainty is our 300 millimeter vertical workstation. The vertical workstation is shown in the lower left and that large black cylinder that you see inside the frame is um, an F.82 transmission sphere with a 300 millimeter input aperture. The question is why is the system so good? Well first it's extremely stable because of the very um, stiff frame that's used around the measurement area. But because it's stable, the direction of travel of the stage is extremely straight. This helps to eliminate one of the smaller errors that haven't been discussed previously, which is that the cat's eye measurement has to be made exactly at the vertex of the part under test. And secondly, we have three metrology lasers in this system. These three lasers offer two advantages. First, the stage is driven by three ball screws and each of the ball screws has a closed loop servo around it with the laser that is closest. By running all three ball screws in closed loop, when we tell the stage to move a particular distance, it moves in a perfectly flat manner. There's no tilting that occurs whatsoever. This also helps to make sure we're measuring at the vertex of the part. The second advantage is that because there's three lasers, when we average the data from the three lasers together, it further improves our uncertainty. Another advantage of these, this system is because the lasers are on the same side of the stage as the part, your measuring uncertainty is proportional to the length of the cavity, unlike in a standard radius slide where the measurement uncertainty tends to increase for shorter parts. The DMI laser interferometer that's used in this system has a position 
resolution of 20 nanometers. And we've proven that the stage is stable to this level as well. When the weather data is entered into the DMI, the stage position uncertainty is at a similar level. So the question is, how well can this system do? Well, one of our customers happens to have three of these workstations. One is equipped with a six-inch interferometer, and two are equipped with 300 millimeter interferometers. They perform a radius measurement test. Each of the three systems was fitted with a different transmission sphere, and then three different parts were measured on each of the three systems. The results of each part measured on the three systems were compared. Using very careful technique and entering the weather information, and then allowing the interferometer to do the auto nulling at both the confocal and cat's eye position, and also allowing the interferometer to automatically translate the part from confocal to cat's eye, we were able to achieve the measurement results shown in this table. Notice that the total variation for each part is extremely small. Um, the worst of the three parts was only 2.6 parts per million. Okay, to summarize in the final slide, the uncertainty of each technique is listed. We start with a spherometer at about half a percent or 5,000 parts per million. And then a test plate is going to be about 300 or 150 parts per million in that range. Then we move on to a radius scale with a mechanical encoder. The uncertainty for that is 25 to 50 microns, and that doesn't really change with the length of the test part. But assuming we have test parts in the range of, um, say, 50 millimeters to a meter or so, we're talking uncertainties in the 100 to 1,000 parts per million range. The radius scale of an interferometric encoder improves on that by a factor of 10 to 10 to 100 parts per million. And finally, with a very carefully designed precision workstation, we've been able to achieve precisions on the order of three parts per million.